Hello and welcome to Beyond Japan, an interdisciplinary podcast that looks at the broad reach of Japanese studies from within and beyond Japan. This podcast is brought to you by the Center for Japanese Studies at the Sainsbury Institute for the Study of Japanese Arts and Cultures, in collaboration with the University of East Anglia. I'm your host, Oliver Moxham, Project Support Officer at the Sainsbury Institute and researcher of Japanese war heritage. This week we are joined by Dr. Naonori Kodate, Associate Professor in Social Policy and Director of Research at University College Dublin, who will introduce us to the growing phenomenon of robotics in elder care. In super-aged Japan, robots are becoming more and more common in assisting care staff in a wide range of activities, from heavy lifting to night nursing, as the human workforce decreases due to depopulation and strict migration policies. NOW's research indicates robots can be more than tools, providing social contact for a demographic commonly afflicted by loneliness. What's more, as other nations begin to see aging populations, robots in the care home may soon become the norm. We hope you enjoy the show. Good morning, NOW. Thank you for joining me on the podcast. Thank you very much, Oliver. It's a great pleasure to be here today, speaking with you. Thank you. So, first of all, we'd like to know a bit more about you. Can you tell us about your area of expertise and how your interests have brought you there? Okay, so I'm currently Associate Professor in Social Policy at University College Dublin and also the founding director of the UCD Center for Japanese Studies, which was established in April last year. And um, I'm a political scientist by training, got retrained as an applied social scientist in my first job as research associate at the National Institute for Health Research Funded Center called King's Patient Safety and Service Quality Research Center which existed between 2008 and 2012. So my career started in the UK and there I belonged to a research unit led by two brilliant psychologists, human factors experts, Janet and Alistair. And we conducted a couple of exciting social science-led multidisciplinary projects around the use of simulation training in improving quality and safety for older people in acute care settings and the use of instant data in acute and mental health hospitals. During that time, I also led a small project funded by the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation to compare the UK and Japanese hospitals and government's efforts in the domain of patient safety as well. In 2012, I crossed the Irish Sea and came to Dublin. And since then I've been teaching and researching here in UCD. So this is my 10th year. It's a little bit scary now, I'm saying this, as I've been away from home home, which is Western Tokyo and um, Tamagawa product area, the border between Masashi no and Tokyo for nearly 20 years. Back to your question, my area of research is comparative health and social care policy, which with sort of very strong influence coming from STS, science, technology and society studies. Since 20. 16, my research projects primarily have been focused on the role of assistive technologies, care robots in particular, in improving care quality and safety for the people and carers from a comparative perspective. There I'm very much interested in national, organizational, and individual level differences and similarities. This is where Japanese studies element, or me as a comparativist, looking at Japan from outside, comes in as an important element of my research. Fascinating. So using robots to aid elder care seems like an excellent example of using modern technologies to resolve modern issues. Before we get into detail about the robotics that you've been working on, could you first give us an idea of what issues elder care is currently facing and how robots might address these problems? Yeah, as I've just said, I came into this area of research from a very much social science perspective and with a particular focus on that sense of security and sense of safety in Japanese words Anshin and Zen and how care robots can deliver that or enhance that. Among Japanese scholars, um, you might probably know um, Professor Yo- Yoichiro Murakami, a pioneer in SDS and philosophy of science in Japan, is somebody I look up to. And as you know, Japan is one of the most rapidly aging economies in the world. And I, I know you had the podcast series before on the theme of super aging and super aged Japan. In 2019, people who are age 65 years old and over account for nearly 30%. And in many municipalities, one third of its population over and more, more than one third 
um, is Croatia and um, all the adults. So just to compare where I live and work in Ireland, the percentage is growing fast, but remains less than 20% as of 2020. So while longevity is something to celebrate, obviously, but Japan is faced with a shortage of care workers. And on top of that, Japan is known for having relatively low intakes of migrant workers. So by 2025, it's estimated that there will be a shortfall of 370 or 380,000 nurses and care workers and of course the workplace environment in long-term care is very very tough so the retention of good care professionals is is always a challenge which again not just applies to japan but also to every country so practical solutions can have to be found somehow and so that all the people can be cared for based on their needs retain their abilities for self-care and retain in their homes and communities as long as possible. In other words, um, care system really needs to be rebuilt over time to support aging in place. And of course, as the population ages, more people will have some form of difficulty with memory, so cognitive impairments and so on. So in Japan, it's estimated that 6 million people or more have dementia. And the country has sort of developed the comprehensive strategy, so-called the New Orange Plan, to promote interministerial collaboration as well as community groups across the country. So we find a variety of community initiatives across the country, sort of trying in different parts of the country. So for, for example, public private sector collaborations, dementia cafes, awareness campaigns, and so on. But these are not sufficient to tackle this major public policy matter. And so what robots can do, um, probably quite a lot, if we can reimagine a care system that's readjusted to meet the needs. A robot, you might know, which, um, is normally defined as an intelligent mechanical system with three main functions. So detecting, assessing and acting on information. And robots, you may have a certain image of robots looking like humans or humanoid type or shaped as an animal, but exoskeletons, for instance, with these functions, detecting, assessing, and acting on information, they are also robots. And in Japan, care robots are very broadly defined, and I'd say there are three types. So first one is physical support type, so power suits, modular robot arm. So you may know a kind of a bear-looking and sort of a robot called Reba, and robots that assist with bathing, dining, sleeping, and so on. So eye care robots, memory scan, and so on. So these robots um, can support transferring of um, all the person or people with um, disability and so on. And this type is mainly targeted at caregivers. And the second type is sort of independent support type. You can call that, describe that. And powered exoskeletons, um, so Cyberdyne, the company creating HAL, um, H-A-L, HAL, and the mobile arm, hand support. And this type is for care recipients living independently. And then the third type is communication type robot or communication or comfort companion um, type robot. So providing, they provide safety monitoring or odd minder, which is sort of a Rima has a reminding function by voice or illustration for the adults with mild to moderate memory impairment and companionship. So Ivo, you probably know Tony's Ivo, the dog robot, and Paro, the seal robot, and the tail robot called Kubo, and so on. So this one, this type could be for both care recipients and caregivers. And in the case of Japan, Robotics or technology-aided care is seen as not only promising, but as an almost inevitable part of a very configured care system. And the government's three ministries, so Keizai Sangyo Sho, uh, Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, and Soumu Sho, Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, and then Kosei Rodo Sho, Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, and the Cabinet Office, Nai Kakufu, have been promoting the use of robots in the last, I'd say, five to 10 years. Notably under the chairpersonship of the former Prime Minister Abe, the new robot strategy was launched in 2015, 
And in 2018, the Ministry of Health, so called Osho, established the Care Robot Development and Promotion Office. So, as a result of, of the, these um, initiatives and strong promotion, for example, robot assisted workers now on the list of reimbursable items under the long term care insurance scheme, so Kaigo o k e n s e d o and local authorities such as Saijo City、um, in Ehime Ken, Ehime Prefecture, is offering a rental service of monitoring and communication robots since 2019. So, the initial cost in that city is 2 man yen, so roughly 120 pounds, and the monthly fee is 5 0 yen, so roughly 30 pounds. Whether you think it's expensive or not, I'm not sure, but that's the kind of service that's been offered in Japan using robotics as part of the government scheme. So, back to your question, the issue is that robots can address physical support by assisted workers, worker equipment. Uh, mitigation of social isolation of older people by offering companionship and extra sense of security by monitoring function and connecting older persons with their family members and care professionals. Thank you for such a comprehensive answer. If I might just dip into the political context a bit, I'm just curious do you think that the reason why the government has been so Supportive of robotics being developed in the care homes, does that reflect their reluctance to have? Migrants coming to Japan?、Um, some people say that, and there is an element of that, I would say, but I don't believe personally、uh, that's the full picture.、Um, I think there is a strong drive from Ministry of Economy, so Keza Sangyo Shou I mentioned.、Um, there is that sort of a development of silver economy because of the demographic shift. So there is that market. To tap into. And so there is that sort of economic incentive rather than just in terms of supplementing the shortage of the workforce. So, and there are a lot of multiple factors there to support this movement towards the use of robotics in care settings. I see. Thank you. So, one argument that has developed around introducing robotics in the care home, referred to as the warm versus cold care debate, where some argue that human interaction is essential and cannot be supplemented with robots. How do you account for this in your research, and what other ethical questions are there to consider around introducing robotics to the world of elder care? Yeah,、um, warm versus cold care debate. That's one of many concerns for a lot of people I speak to throughout my research. And one questionnaire study we carried out in 2019 with potential end users of care robots.、Uh, we had 1, just over 1,000 people,、um, respondents in total, in Japan, Ireland, and Finland.、Um, these results clearly pointed out that people have a lot of high expectations for care robots, anticipations, and so on. But Almost everyone said care robots should not replace human care and interactions. So that's the first thing and to say. And my care robot projects have always been using a multidisciplinary lens, so involving frontline care professionals and academics from various disciplines, such as nursing, social work, medical, engineering, sociology, and psychology. And in my research team, nobody really believes that human care. Can be substituted by robots. No, it should be.、Um, but at the same time, nobody on the team would say there aren't pressing issues, which I、um, briefly described earlier, that need some practical solutions. So, ethical questions such as dignity, privacy, and safety have been an essential part of our research. So,、um, we always wanted to go beyond that dichotomy of cold versus warm care. But it is true to say that communication robots, which are commercially available in Japan and elsewhere, tend to look sort of cold、um, and often they are made sort of a hard shell. And so their appearance is cold. And I'll come back to this issue later in terms of the appearance and its impact on older people. But before that, I'd like to give you one example of a research project. In a nursing home in East Tokyo, led by professors Obayashi and Masayama,、um, geriatrician and care home manager, began with this question How can we create more time for care professionals to provide human care with the help of socially assisted robots? 
So we looked at the previous care processes um, using a holistic systems approach and tried to find where the gaps were and where the needs were. Where we found, what we found there was ward rounds during very stressful night shifts where there were a lot of risks of slips, trips and falls among all the residents. We brought in communication robots available from the market, so hard shell, and you could say that's, that has a cold looking sort of appearance. And then we connected those communication robots up with infrared monitoring cameras, which sends alerts to a central nursing station, as well as mobile apps of each care staff on the ward on duty if they detect some movement in the rooms. Ideally, one person care professional can look after each older person resident, but that's not realistic. And we wanted to prioritize safety. And we, after the introduction of this connected technology, our research results um, demonstrated that the number of incidents dropped, while care professional stress level during these night shifts was also reduced. So it's really more about maximizing the benefits of using technologies for all end users as opposed to cold versus warm care. And going back to our three country questionnaire study, Finland, Ireland, Japan, and it was led by um, Professor Sua and Professor Yu at Chiba University. The emphasis on self-determination on, and the role of family members, very strong and very interesting comparatively. So in Ireland and Finland, um, respondents of a survey, so all the people, care professionals and family carers, answers there should be some form of rights-based approach to human care moving forward in the future. So their key was, um, would be participation, empowerment and self-determination of all the people themselves in care planning and decision making. And these concepts are very strongly supported in these two countries. On the other hand, in Japan, instead of the older person herself or himself, um, the role of family members making decisions on their behalf as proxy in cases of a decline in the person's decision making capacities due to dementia or other causes was very strong. So this refers to the decision as to the use of care robots at home and what sort of functions should be used and the use of biomedical data that robots can collect and share with how his GP, for instance. So the very important ethical question of who decides, um, that can vary across country. So there are some differences in the focus and nuances across countries when we started to dig deeper. And we certainly should be mindful of people's fear. So the fear of care robots as a substitute for human beings and human care, which you raised, and care robots as a threat to the quality of care and care professionals' jobs, skills, and decision-making autonomy, etc. So this is exactly why I believe um, we need more multidisciplinary research like ours and gather evidence as we go forward and um, developing care robots and reflecting on our care policy and practice in Japan and beyond Japan. I see. Thank you. This might seem like a bit of a, a frivolous question, but I'm just curious, do you think there's a bit of a, a perhaps a stigma against integrating robots into people's daily lives from how they appear in popular culture? I know there's a lot of disaster films about robots taking over humanity and that sort of thing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I don't necessarily think there is stigma. I think there is, because it's sort of pervasive, I mean, it's, um, the stereotypes of robots and sort of, in a sense, images of robots in Japan in particular, in pop culture, kind of good guys and sort of heroes. And so they, they have a very positive image in Japan. So as long as they are used for fun and entertainment and so on, I think they're absolutely fine. And I think people, most people are very familiar with them and they're not really frightened by them. But I think in people's minds, still, they are not taken seriously as part of the care system. So once they are brought in, as long as it's additional function that says something, good morning, and um, how are you, and sort of, a, as you know, like the paper robots, like in hotels and so on, I think they are very much welcomed. But 
I think a lot of people still don't believe they could be a kind of part of the care team, so to say. So that is more of an issue in terms of wider social implementation. I see. Thank you. So could you give us some examples of the kind of robotics already being used in elder care in Japan and what kind of robots you've been developing through your own research? Okay. Um, yeah, this is interesting. So in 2019 and 2020, our team developed an original soft cuddly toy with some communicative functions for bedside use in the same nursing home, which I mentioned earlier, sort of having the monitoring cameras and communication robots like all combined. The former commercially available communication robots had a hard shell, so cold looking robot, and their eyes flash with green lights at night and so on. So it's not the same as cold care, but the hard shell appearance with a robotic voice, that wasn't really ideal, especially for older persons with mild to moderate cognitive impairment. So we managed to get a large scale funding to develop a soft flash toy type, sort of Neuvillemi type robot with similar functionality. So limited, but basic communicative functions. And then we evaluated the impact of these original robots on people's and older older person's engagement. The overall concept was the same. So it's connected up with the existing technologies, such as the monitoring camera and the nurse course system. But this time, the pace of the robot speech was slowed down a bit, and the soft robot can be hanged on the bed rail so that all the person can touch and cuddle. And so on, the sound traveled much better as a result. And because it's, um, it's hanged on the bed rail, so it's physically closer to other people than the previous communication robots that were basically put on the bedside table. In the same nursing home, we use other types of robots, um, such as exoskeleton, power suits, and so on. But this original soft type communication robot was a kind of an attempt to engage end users in the design process and assess how these changes in the materials, the appearance, and the functionality affect usability. In Japan, there is a body called um, the Council for Needs Seas Corporation, which try to connect all the adults, family caregivers, care professionals, including OTs and PTs and physiotherapists and and occupational therapists and manufacturing developers. But the the mismatch between them, so developers and users, is still a big issue. So I'm hoping our research can be useful to bridge that gap. I see. Thank you. So... Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, many have faced long-term isolation due to social restrictions. After over a year of socializing largely through phones and computers, do you think this has made the idea of getting social contact from robots a more familiar concept for the general public? Yeah, the quick answer to your question is um, definitely. But as we've just started to come out of this pandemic gradually and cautiously in the UK and Ireland, after more than a year of some sort of social or physical distancing, most people probably desperately want human touch, um, ditching anything with screens and so computers. So also I heard that in the UK, hugging might be allowed very soon. So I guess it's sort of, yes. I mean, it's true that people got used to having online screen and also connecting with people through some sort of assistive technologies. But I guess for the time being, maybe they they don't necessarily want to engage with that. But once again, if we look at the needs of residential care homes and how they had to and still having to in many countries handle the great challenge, I would say, of continuing to provide care for all the people while ensuring a high level of vigilance and preparedness for community infections. The benefit of telemedicine, telecare, care robots and other assistive technologies now much more widely recognized and acknowledged and perhaps embraced with not much hesitation. Um, Without pandemic, this would not have happened so quickly. And how the nursing home handled this um, pandemic using technologies is captured by our upcoming short film, Targets of Care, which I produced as part of my project funded by Toyota Foundation. 
Right. Now, as you've just mentioned, I understand you have a film screening coming up on the 20th of May entitled Circuits of Care, Aging in Japan's Robot Revolution. Could you tell us a bit more about the film and what you hope it will achieve? The film project is led by David Prendervast, a professor in anthropology at Menuth University in Ireland. I took part as a producer and David directed it um, with the crew members, Daniel, Harry and others. We filmed it um, in Tokyo and the greater Tokyo area back in late 2019, um, so before the pandemic and it feels like a long, long time ago now. Um, we had great crack, as Irish people would say, and we had so much fun filming it. And the film follows care professionals and researchers developing and testing care robots in a broader sense for all the adults. It shows um, cybernetic walking supports, companion robots and automated sensor networks, and all the adults, experts and care professionals share the experiences of the practical benefits these technologies bring, the problems they potentially create, also the relationships or unexpected relationships that can develop between them and robots. And so David and I are going to hit the road very soon, well, or virtually, as you kindly mentioned on the 20th of May, um, the UC Center for Japanese Studies hold the film screen together with the Fondation France-Japon, which is part of the School of Advanced Studies and Social Sciences based in Paris. This will, will be our first joint event. And David and I will be taking questions and afterwards. We'll be then speaking at Responsibility Summit. I don't know whether you know that summit, um, formerly known as the Anthropology Plus Technology Conference on the following day, and a couple of other events in the coming weeks and months what I would like to achieve with this film, as your podcast title, Beyond Japan, captures that very well, I think. The film is really about Japan and Japanese people's everyday life and developing care robots, testing them and, or living with them against the background of this notion of aging crisis. But there are many facets of this film that are so universal, so human versus robots, and potential benefits of using care robots and risks associated with their use. So I'd like to open the dialogue and kick off the conversations around um, those aspects, including some of Japan's unique characteristics. Um, so in the film, you will see Japanese houses, nursing homes, cities, so physical space, and then a scene from robot parties, um, very Japanese, so in the subculture, and also people's attention to detail and all of that. And I've shown this film to my own students um, in the city, so in social policy, public policy, or interdisciplinary Japanese studies module, and have a very interesting discussions. So one student said, um, people always say robots are the ones to be scared of, but people actually are the ones to abuse sometimes. So it can be safer with robots. Or another student said that the side effects of using these technologies and started to rely on them are the ones to watch out for. So professionally and socially, so something to do with skills and empathy and so on and so forth. So they really teach me a lot watching this film together. So given the pandemic, which you mentioned changing the whole human technology interactions, the significance of caregiving. Um, I'm very excited to bring this film out to a wider audience living outside Japan and beyond those who are normally interested in technology and robots. Great, we all, all look forward to watching that. Thank you for answering my questions so far now. Before we finish the episode, could you share with us any of the projects that you're currently working on? Thank you, yeah. Um, I will try and answer this as succinctly as possible. My current project is an international and interdisciplinary project called Harmonization Towards the Establishment of Person-Centered Robotics Aided Care System, HAPROX or HAP in short. And this project involves researchers from Hong Kong, France, Japan and Ireland. Despite the pandemic and um, delaying our project at various stages, we have been looking at public discourses around care robots in elder care in different jurisdictions. 
conducting expert interviews. And in the coming year, we will try and bring in a robot into a nursing home in Japan and Ireland and assess care professionals' interactions with robots, how that introduction of robots changes their practices and the outcome. So we are hoping to contribute to creating some sort of a roadmap for coexistence of care robots and humans, while sort of creating a network of researchers across disciplines, ages, nationalities. And I very much hope I will have another opportunity to report to your listeners about what we will find there in the future. Well, you're welcome on the show anytime. Thank you now. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. You can find the link to Now's research profile in the description below. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Ryoko Matsuba, lecturer in Japanese Digital Arts and Humanities at the Sainsbury Institute, to discuss the digitization of cultural artifacts. As part of the Shotoku intervention at the Sainsbury Center for Visual Arts, Ryoko has been organizing digital scanning workshops at the center, where light-sensitive artifacts, which typically cannot go on display, will finally be made viewable and accessible in digital form. Ryoko will explain how digitizing artifacts not only makes them more accessible, but also furthers research into the cultures they represent, as well as the practical precautions that must be taken in the digitization process. We hope you'll join us then. Thank you for listening.